So welcome everybody to this month's first Friday with the Thought Leader. As is always, we start our first Fridays with a coherence moment. And Alexander, I will let you, uh, turn it over to you to lead that. Yeah, sure. So as is our tradition, uh, we start with a, just a, let me get on video, excuse me. Just notice that. Uh, a moment of coherence. So everybody just sit comfortably in a comfortable sitting position. And this is just to get our mind and our heart space in the right place as we engage with uh, Alfonso today. Um, everybody take a deep breath. And close your eyes. And just begin to breathe in a nice rhythmic manner with longer, deeper breaths. Longer, deeper breaths in and out. Relax into each breath. Let your thoughts be transient. And now focus on the area in and around your heart. Imagine an open space in that area and imagine breathing in and out through that space. Longer, deeper breaths through the heart space. Now activate a, a genuine feeling of gratitude or appreciation for someone, someplace, something in your life. Actually feel that feeling. Breathing in, in and out through the heart space. Okay, with that, come back into the room. One more deep breath. And that is our coherence moment. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Alexander. So this is First Friday with the Thought Leader. And this is very specifically for the Corentis community of global practitioners. So who are the global practitioners? This is everyone who we've engaged with and interacted with for over the past 25 years. So some of the organizations that we've partnered with are here. We certainly have our own programs as well, um, but this is the community in which we bring people together. So our so, so, so thrilled to bring Alfonso, which Alexander, who Alexander and I know as um, affectionately as Monty. But Alfonso is an academic. He is a consultant and musician. He is currently the professor at California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco and has been distinguished professor in the School of Fine Arts at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and at the University of Rome. Among other university positions, in 1985 to 1986, he taught at the Central South University in Hunan, China. He is the author of numerous books, some of which you can see on the screen, articles and research which focuses on the future, leadership, creativity, transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary yeah, complexity, <laughs> education, and social change, and has been translated into Chinese, French, Italian, and Spanish. He is the co-editor of the academic journal World Futures and on the board of numerous academic publications. Alfonso is also a consultant in areas of leadership development, creativity, and innovation. His international clients have included Fortune 500 companies, nonprofits, and artists. His father was Italian and mother Dutch. And he grew up speaking several languages. He was born in the Netherlands, lived in Lebanon, Greece, England, and China before finally setting in, settling into the US in 1986. He is an active musician and producer. 
He's performed with uh, recorded artists such as Joe Henderson, Roy Hargrove, Charles Brown, as to camera, and his wife, who's lovely, um, the jazz singer Kitty Margolis. Little personal note um, on how Alexander and I met Monty is one of the most powerful books I've ever read, and even to date, is one he wrote <clears throat> called From Power to Partnership. And I read that in the early 90s, and it moved me so much. I'm like, I've got to reach out to this person. And I did. And he responded. And we, Alexander and I flew to California, saw, um, met Alfonso in person. And then Alfonso and Kitty came to New York, in which we've seen them. So he's, for all those years since the mid early 90s, I, I believe, um, we've been uh, staying connected and friends. And so is with great, great honor and respect that I bring to you today, Alfonso Montiori. Wow, thank you. What a what a lovely and generous introduction, Janice. And yeah, it's, it's a little mind boggling when I think back on, to those days, right? It's, yeah, uh, right. yeah, yeah. So, uh, so thank you. Uh, I'm I'm delighted to be here. I I can see that this is a a, a, a wonderful group uh, with some uh, considerable foodies by the uh, by the sounds of it. So I, I'm feeling quite at home and wishing I could go to a nice bistro in Paris. Um, so um, yeah, so I'm gonna the the future has always been an interest of mine and and sometimes i i think back and i wonder well why uh, why was i always fascinated by it maybe it had something to do with the uh the the science fiction shows that were around when i was a kid like the original star trek and lost in space but i think it i think it was more related to sort of this persistent sense that you know, life could be better. You know, there's a beautiful song by Paul Simon with a great line in it called The Thought That Life Could Be Better is woven indelibly into our hearts and our bones, right? So maybe that's what it is. And and so I've been pursuing that. And and I'm going to give you just, you know, in this very brief time, uh, a few of the things that, that I've found very interesting and from my research and my experience and sort of some threads and and suggestions um and and i think inevitably one is that the future begins right here i think sometimes we spend too much time thinking well when this happens and when we get that done or um but the but i think ultimately if we want to create the future, we have to begin by embodying the future right now, meaning how do we want to show up in the future? And and I think starting by showing up that way right now is probably the one of the one of the key factors that that uh that uh, i've learned about in the in the last more than 30 years it seems uh, and of course that also means that we have to know what we want the future to be like and and how we do want to show up in the future and so um you know very often we see these these images of the future uh and they all have to do with things with technology with you know all these wonderful possibilities but but we tend to leave ourselves out of them in a way and uh and i think it's important to to acknowledge that that um our presence as as human beings is is key to the whole story, and and I don't think we can wait uh, uh, before we show up the way we would like to be in the future. Because what if everybody's waiting uh, to show up with their best future self, right? Uh, so I think uh, a key factor is then figuring out, along with, of course, how we would like the world to be, is like how how do we want to be? What 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 is it that I can do to show up and and bring out the best in myself? Um, next slide, please. So um, we know from psychology that there are two types of of motivation. Um, there's approach motivation and avoid motivation. 
Uh, the dentist is an example of avoid motivation, right? I go to the dentist to avoid, uh, I, I suffer going to my dentist uh, and, and the minor pains I experience there in order to avoid bigger and uh, and more troublesome pains. And But at the same time, I don't go around waving a flag going yay dentist you know as much as i like my dentist uh, and and one of the things that's been happening in recent years is we're seeing a lot more avoid motivation in the sense that we see people being against a lot of things you know whether you know on the various political spectrums we're against climate change or we're against woke or we're against this and we're against that um but again, uh, uh, what gets lost certainly in that in that discourse is, well, what are we really for, right? What is it that really matters to us? Which of course brings us back to our earlier slide. And, and one of the things that, that uh, we've noticed is that uh, sometimes we lose track of what we are really for. And that the things that we claim we're for are things that we've come to believe we should be for. Uh, and it pays, again, to really check in with ourselves and say, well, what are we really, really for? Uh, and I think this is a this was going to be a recurring theme in this brief presentation, uh, that we're, we're in an area, uh, era of, of transformation, of chaos, of contradiction, of confusion. It's being called a post-normal era just because what you know may have been normal even 10 years ago is just not normal anymore. Um, and in that time, it's easy to sort of lose track of what we're really for. Uh, we're bombarded by messages. We're bombarded by a lot of negative messages. So we want to, you know, avoid all that stuff. Um, but what are we really for? What does it mean uh, to, to be a good person? What does it mean to be a great group? Uh, so again, this, this urge to slow down and really uh, reflect on what we're for because in a chaotic time it's it's we we're seeing that it's easy to lose track of that particularly when there are a lot of urgent things pulling at us and when there are every news item is some other bizarre thing and and we're just sort of overwhelmed and can't even figure out what's going on anymore so uh, so this would be then this exploration of what are we really for? Um, next slide, please. Um, one of the things that we're seeing globally uh, is, is a loss of hope, particularly with young people. And of course, without hope, we really do perish. And in organizations without hope, we, well, we may not completely perish, but we'll definitely get grumpy. Um, and and so even before specific goals, we need a sense of the possible. And what we're seeing socially on a larger level is that uh, a lot of people are losing a sense of the possible because they see themselves as uh, uh, being uh, uh, caught in in uh, sort of all these different possible negative scenarios that are coming down the pike. Uh, I just saw this BBC piece on uh, a, a considerable number of uh, young couples who are not having children because of environmental anxiety, for instance. And that's just one of uh, uh, many things that happen. Some aren't, aren't saving because they think the world is going to go to hell in a handbasket. And so then, um, and there's a loss of the sense of the possible, right? Uh, which goes back to, if I don't think that anything is really possible, then how does that relate to what I feel and what I would really like, right? So it's easy to lose perspective and think that what, is right now is what we're stuck with and there's sort of this inertia that's pushing us forward and we're just being swept along and um 
you know, in organizations that can often manifest itself as, uh, you know, the flavor of the month initiative, but we know that essentially the organization is going to stay the same because that's just sort of, that's, that's the underlying reality. Oh, whoops. Can we just quickly go back to the, uh, previous one? Yes. And so, um, a creative mindset is a mindset that is open to possibility, but also generates possibility. So an effort to get beyond a certain stuckness uh, uh, that we're noticing within organizations, we're noticing uh, uh, globally, politically, and, and, uh, and uh, anyway, so let's move on to the next, to the next one. Uh, this is a big, um, Development in psychology, I would say. Historically, these psychologists have argued uh, legitimately that, that our history, uh, our experiences in life uh, play a huge role in who we are. You know, whether it's my father, my mother, my uh, the kids that I grew up with, the traumas I experienced, all this combines to, to uh, uh, create who I am right now. What is really interesting uh, um, and is that now people are finding uh, research, very solid research is finding that the future creates the present. Now, what does that mean? That means that if I think that the world is going to go to hell in a handbasket, I might decide not to have kids. Or as other young couples are doing, I might decide to not safe and party like it's 1999. Um, if I see the kids in my neighborhood end up in prison or die young, I might think that that's the expected future for me too. So the image of the future plays a, a very big role in how I behave today and how we all behave today. Um, which is why it's important to sort of uncover what our image uh, of the future is, what kind of future we're expecting. And because it is an expected future, it's not like we're predicting a sort of a deterministic future. So then this allows us to sort of engage with our vision of the future uh, and change it and, again, get in touch with what really matters to us and focus it uh, in a direction that's uh, that's more along the lines of what we really want rather than be pulled along uh, uh, by this uh, expectation of what the future uh, will be like. Yes, and of course, not everything can be changed. Um, so one of the things that that uh, uh, we're seeing is quite successful. And this can happen, uh, uh, this can be used both at an individual level, uh, at a group level or an organizational level, uh, which is connecting with the future self, with our future self. Uh, and uh, um, again, this requires sort of stepping out of the, the, the flow of everyday work and everyday activities and and taking time to slow down and reflect and look at what matters, where we want to go, um, which again, I think be in a time of, of rapid change, of confusion, of chaos, it's easy to get caught up in that chaos and confusion. And, and that's why it's even more important to, to get in touch with the things that we value. What do we really care about? What really matters? Um, Next slide, please. So one simple exercise is, is to communicate with our future self. Uh, so by writing our future self a letter at various intervals in the future, uh, in which we tell our future self what we're committed to uh, and who we promise to be and, and where we promise to be on those future dates. Uh, just the fact that we're thinking about that already begins to orient us and to get us sort of in touch with, uh, 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 it. put it this way, it makes the future self come alive to some extent. Um, and um, uh, next slide, please. 
we can do the same with the future self writing back to us uh, from 12 months, a year, three years, five years, and have the uh, future self tell the current self who we are, what our life is like, what we're fo focused on, and potentially even uh, uh, share some advice. Um, this is a variation on some uh, uh, sort of exercises that have been around for a long time, but the focus here specifically is this connection with the future self. And of course, it's a form of internal dialogue, um, but it is a way to get in touch with what we really care about, what really matters, uh, um, and, and get out of the sort of potential inertia of just doing what we're doing because there are all these urgent matters that need to be uh, uh, taken care of and getting in touch with with the, what is important uh, to us and what will lead us to a life that is more meaningful and not a situation where we suddenly turn around and go, wow, 10 years have gone by, what happened? Um, whether And and. This has been used in groups as well, which I find very interesting. And there are variations in the way that it can be used for groups, but it's actually a, a very interesting exercise that you can that you can play with. Um, cultivating skills for a, a creative mindset, I think, is is uh, drawing on some of the creativity research that's been around for a very long time and proved tremendously solid. Um, and historically it was presented as these are the characteristics of creative people. And a lot of people would say, well, I'm not creative. I don't have these characteristics. So it was sort of an either or situation. What we're becoming aware of now is that these, of course, are skills and attitudes that we can cultivate. Uh, they, it's, they're, they're not genetic gifts uh, of, of genius. They're qualities that, that we can cultivate. And of course, particularly for, for today's world, tolerance for ambiguity and uncertainty is, is very important. Um, and this involves a switch in terms of seeing uncertainty and ambiguity as opportunities to create and to interpret our own, to, to interpret what's going on in the world, but also not immediately wanting to impose an answer, right? So, so people who are intolerant for ambiguity want everything black and white, immediately want to be clear about what's going on, don't, can't handle uncertainty, don't, un, can't bear it. And instead, giving ourselves the time to be with the ambiguity and to be with the certainty also allows answers and opportunities to emerge that we have to uh, we we have to have a certain amount of trust in ourselves to allow that to happen independence of judgment um uh, it's really easy to get swept up into the latest fad into the latest political or trendy this or that um but keeping that independence of judgment uh, you know arguably all american attitude uh, um and uh combined of course with the tolerance for ambiguity and an ability to be self-critical Contextual awareness, it's not all about me, shockingly. Um, and that means listening. It means scanning the environment. It means being aware of what's going on around us and that we are part of a larger system and that we need to understand what's going on rather than moving along without uh, just concerned exclusively with ourselves. Um cultivating yin and yang so breaking out of you know maybe a tendency to be only uh, hard driving uh you know a certain image of masculinity for instance and being able to balance the two so being empathic but also being able to ask hard questions make the tough decisions and so on creating that that internal balance and what we found from creativity research is that people who are very creative do have that much greater balance and don't sort of conform to stereotypes of masculinity or femininity or whatever. Um, 
a recurring theme in these the this brief talk awareness of time knowing when to slow down and when to accelerate um we all know people who are pedal to the metal 100 percent of the time and we also know that they can get a lot done but it can also be extremely tiresome for them and maybe for us so the importance of slowing down uh, again particularly during these times constantly questioning assumptions what are the underlying uh, assumptions, patterns, what is holding a particular situation together. Uh, we can always find that there are basic assumptions that are being made at a certain point that, that undergird uh, our behavior and our way of thinking. Uh, and those need to be surfaced. Um, making connections. Uh, the, we can always see that there are possibilities of 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 connecting things that haven't been connected before which is a classic definition of uh, of creativity uh so seeing how things are interconnected and connecting uh, uh as much as we can and finally being playful uh particularly in situations where things get quote very serious going back to the yin and yang here it's it's important to be able to also address those in a way that doesn't suffer from the sort of the constriction that seriousness create and to be able to play with ideas and not take the ideas or ourselves too seriously in the sense of well this is my idea uh but to be able to play with the ideas and not get too invested in ownership, if you will. Um, next slide. Thank you very much. Alfonso, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, Julie, you want to, well, I will remove, we're going to open it up for Q&A. Julie, you want to stop sharing so we can see everybody? So thank you so much. And I, I'm sure even just with that little short period of time, you can see how uh, Alfonso is a great thinker and one of my favorite authors on the planet. <laughs> so if people want to raise their hand or in chat want to be called on to ask um, any questions, share any comment, this is the Q&A part. Alfonso, I'm interested in your comment that our expected future about the expected future and I'm trying to, I kind of get that into my body somehow. And I wonder if you could just elaborate a bit more on how we know when we're thinking of our expected future and how we're being our future today. Does that question make sense? Yeah, well, certainly the the being the future today has to do with what, you know, if, if um our future self is really our choice, right? Our choice of how we want to show up, right? Um, and so our future self really then is the self that we would like to be in a in the future, in a situation after, you know, growth, development, and all this kind of thing. But part of the problem there is that that can be postponed forever in a way, right? So the thing is to figure out what some of the the key elements are that that are are important to us. You know, some of them are, can be very basic. It's like, like, how do we approach life? Do we approach life as a zero sum game, or do we approach it as an effort to create a win win situation for everybody? Right? If we decide I want a win win world, and then the I can begin in whatever way I, I can to think about that and try to embody that as much as I can, right? Does that does that make sense? Just sort of as a as a starting point, or if I, you know, if I see uh, uh, my community as fragmented, and I just see well, there's people over here and people over there. If I see it as an interconnected system, and I can I can start 
thinking about my world in a different kind of way, you know, and and thinking systemically isn't just a, 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 a wonderful thing in a way. I think we have to be a little skeptical there too, because you know, part of the part of the, you know, uh, you know, the Buddhists would say that seeing the world as as interconnected and dependent, co-arising, and so is is actually an aspect of enlightenment. Uh, but the the other side to that is is um, you know, people who are paranoid think everything is connected and it's all militating against them, <laughs> right? So, 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 so there is another side to it, right? Um, so, but my point is, yeah, so certainly, you know, wanting to know who, who would we like to be and starting with not, well, I'm going to wait for the better world for that to happen, starting right now, right? Um, and the expected self, you know, I, I think there there's sort of a tendency to believe that we're going to be the same people that we are now five, 10 years from now, or even a year from now, but, but we actually do change. Um, and, you know, when you get to be my age, um, you, you, you start noticing that, you know, I'm still the same kid I was when I was five years old, but boy, a lot has changed. And, uh, you know, a lot of it's gotten creakier and a little heavier, a little, a lot. But, um, but there are also, um, you know, beyond that, people, people are different. And, and we can tap into that fluidity, you know, rather than sort of letting it happen to us. You know, there are some things that we can't really change. But there are other things that, you know, we can we can really work with, right? Um, because I think people have an idea of, well, that's, you know, I get this, and it's just going to be something deterministic. Mm -hmm. And it isn't, you know, we have far more flexibility and, and, and agency than we think, you know, there's this feeling that we're sort of on this, uh, you know, we're being pushed along by time and society. But we can intervene. Thank you. Thanks. Mike. Oh, and then uh, and then Joe. Uh, Alfonso, thank you very much for for your comments. Um, two questions. One, does one of your books focus specifically on the topic that you are discussing? And if so, which one? Sorry, three questions. That's two. Mm -hmm. um, and the third question is where where, if at all, do probabilities fit into your into the thinking about the expected future? I mean, is is there a quantitative side to an approach about thinking about the future in your mind, or is it all qualitative? Um, my approach has been uh, uh, qualitative, but I think if you look at issues like larger issues like climate change and so on, I mean, there are probabilities or everything in a way, right? Uh, because there's nothing really deterministic, well, except for death and taxes, if you will. But um, the, uh, yeah, I mean, as you know, climate scientists, for instance, are talking about, you know, um, once we go beyond certain points, then the probability of going to hell in a handbasket is much greater. And and this is the case for so many different things. Um, uh, for personal, you know, at a personal level, we're still talking about probabilities, um, but the quantitative dimension, I think, is less uh obvious and maybe we can think about it more uh generally rather than get very specific but for big social issues absolutely yeah probabilities play a play a big part in that but again that's also a question of interpretation though right um how we're seeing what the various factors are i mean if you see something like the club of rome predictions i mean they were useful in mobilizing people to think about the the, the future and climate and so on. But at the same time, a lot of the actual quantitative dimension was just wrong, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But it does give the illusion of being more serious, right? Right. And, and the book, book? focuses. Yeah. I'm sorry? 
the and, book. And Monty, is it your current book? Oh, um, yeah, the current book is an edited book. Um, I'm working on on the the larger sort of development of of what I'm uh, what I've been talking about today. Yeah, but there's this handbook of creative futures, which you know it's it's more of an academic tome, but uh, there there are some very interesting things um in there uh and in, any number of interesting authors like Fritjof Capra is in there Rihanna Eisler is in there and, and stuff that's worth reading uh about the future I think yeah great thank you we very much thank you thanks Mike we don't have a whole lot of time left but Joe do you have a quick question yeah I do uh Alfonso I'm working with a client who has relied heavily on her left brain finance mm -hmm. engineering concrete sequential person trying to help her with cultivating the creative mindset. And I think the guidelines you gave are good, but I'm wondering in cases like that, are there any more exercises that you would recommend or books that you'd recommend? You know, my experience, you know, living just and 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 working with a lot of folks from, from Silicon Valley, living in San Francisco, you know, one of the things that has worked for me uh, uh, is uh, getting people to take improv classes because you actually throw them in a situation where they have to do stuff <laughs> and they have to do stuff in front of people. And, and it's not sort of abstract because my experience is it's so easy for them to go abstract, right. To stay in the left brain, to interpret everything from the perspective of the left brain. But when they're standing there and they have to improvise, it may turn out that they're very good at it. Right. But of course their whole, their whole mentality is, uh, you know, set the way that they see themselves. So, yeah, that would be my suggestion. Get them to take an improv class. Um, so thank you, Monty, for being with us. Thank you, everybody. Seeing you know, some great thank you. friends and faces in the room. Muthoni, it's so good to see you. Um, and so many others. Um, Alexander, would you like to take us out? Yeah, I'll, I'll take everybody out. <laughs> In a coherent, mindful way. Monty, so first, uh, first, first of all, yes. Then, no, no, no. You're going to say what I'm going to say. So perfect. I just wanted to say hi, Monty. It's been nice. Hi, Alexander. So no, great to see you. To see you. And I really appreciated the um, the letter writing exercise. I never thought about that. That seems like a really valuable exercise, one that I'd love to do for myself and I could see being very useful with my coaching clients. So thank you for that. Yeah. Really okay. nice. All right. So we'll make it very simple as a as, as, a, as a checkout. Everybody just uh, take a deep breath. Can we just take one moment of just a round of applause? Oh, sure. <laughs> thank you. You're very kind. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So everybody take a deep breath. And the way we like to end these sessions is just a moment of reflection. Just close your eyes for a moment and reflect back on the past 45 minutes. All that you heard, that you may have learned, and just let bubble up in your mind's eye what are some of the key insights or ideas or fresh thoughts you may have captured here. It's always nice just to reflect after a period of learning. And take another deep breath. Feel free to jot those down or just to capture them in your mind. And with that, Janice, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. So thank you again, Monty. Thank you, Julie and Alexander, for participating, um, co-hosting with me. And thank you, everybody, for being here, sharing part of your Friday. I wish you all the best and happy weekend. <laughs>